tonight, voices getting louder and angrier as this hostage crisis stretches on. Calls to action from terrified family members and governments around the world. What they want to see happen now for Israeli families to get their loved ones home safely. Back here at home, too, some late-breaking developments on that speaker fight for House Republicans with their latest nominee lasting all of just three hours. So where do things stand now? Literal minute-by-minute minute developments we're going to take you to Capitol Hill. Then a showdown years in the making between former President Donald Trump and his former fixer. The testimony from Michael Cohen that prosecutors hope could be the smoking gun proving their case. And the alleged crime that's as startling, perhaps, as it was terrifying. The pretty trippy excuse from the guy accused of trying to down a commercial plane. And Californians tonight up in arms over driverless cars on the streets. The big safety concerns leading to new suspensions tonight and protests out west. We've got that coming up later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, more pressure and more anger now aimed at all quarters, including the Israeli government, from world leaders, from families of those taken hostage in this war between Israel and Hamas after that terror attack against Israel almost three weeks ago. You've got families outside the U.N. a little earlier saying they want to see something done now. What would you do? We will tell you 18 days you don't know if that loved one is alive, dead, getting fed where he slept. Children the mothers, the elderly, these hostages need to be back yesterday, not tomorrow, yesterday. Bring them back. The Israeli foreign minister there also at that event with some people in the crowd shouting the Hebrew word for shame at him. Of the 7th of October. Some people there wanted to know why the Israeli government didn't or couldn't do more to prevent the Hamas attack back on October 7th. That rally here in the U.S. being held with some 200 other hostages still in the hands of Hamas terrorists. As we're learning more now tonight about what exactly it's like to be held captive by that terror group. You have a Lifshitz. You see her here in this image, taken from a Hamas video as she is handed over to the Red Cross. She was released yesterday along with another Israeli, Nurit Cooper. Lifshitz says she went through hell when she was taken by Hamas, her daughter, translating some of what she described to reporters outside a hospital in Tel Aviv. Listen. While she was being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks by Shabab. Yeah, Shabab people. You see her there describing Shabab people, presumably a reference to the Al-Shabab group designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. It comes as health officials in Gaza say their hospitals could go out of service any minute now, putting a bunch of people's lives at risk because they do not have enough fuel to keep things running. The U.N. saying aid workers might have to stop operations by tomorrow night if they don't get fuel ASAP. We've got it all covered from every angle tonight. Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv. Kier Simmons is in Doha in Qatar for us tonight. Hala, let me start with you with these conversations over getting hostages released. Some of the anger that you're seeing now from some of these families of people who have been taken by Hamas. After, after all, it was Hamas that took these people in the first place. And this sort of insight that we're getting now into what it is actually like to be taken by terrorists. Uh, well, we heard from the 85-year-old uh, uh, hostage, Yoshevitz Lifchitz, who was re released yesterday alongside another uh, elderly uh, woman, and she described that network of tunnels under Gaza. She says that she was abducted on a motorcycle from her kibbutz and that she was then made to walk a few kilometers inside those dark and dank tunnels. While there, though, she says she received medical care and that she was given food and water and that uh, the the place where she was being held was relatively uh, clean, but obviously this would have been an absolutely terrifying ordeal for her. The husbands of the two released hostages are still detained, and there are no signs that any imminent releases of further hostage releases are uh, expected in the coming days. Uh, there seem to be some holdups as to, uh, uh, in terms of what ne where negotiations are stalling. Uh, could it be over fuel? Could it be over uh, other uh, demands or requests from the Hamas side or the Israeli uh, side? And the Israeli military, by the way, is dropping leaflets over Gaza. It's asking ordinary Gazans uh, to help them locate hostages that uh, if they cooperate 
operate so they can do it anonymously and they can be compensated for their efforts. But it's important to note that this is happening against the backdrop of tremendous humanitarian suffering in the Gaza Strip. The United Nations Relief Agency in charge of refugees in Gaza is saying if it doesn't get fuel urgently, it will cease operations by tomorrow evening. Hallie? Hala, I'm going to ask you to stand by here. Kira, I want to go to you here because Hala touched on some of these negotiations. You are there. Um, can you give us a sense of what this actually looks like behind the scenes? Any sense that you're getting from the reporting that you and our team are doing on timing for the potential release of more hostages here? Well, Harley, the talk now is about uh, the potential for a larger group of hostages to be released. We've seen two and then two more. Now the conversation is about a larger group. I'm told that the talks are positive. There is no breakdown, though there is no breakthrough. And I think part of the question with these talks is that Hamas is asking for... Uh, concessions, if you like, that quite simply the Israelis and the U.S. are not prepared to give. What the Israelis and the U.S. are saying is you simply need to release these civilians. Take a listen to what the Secretary of State had to say today. Their loved ones must be released immediately, unconditionally, and every member of this council, indeed, every member of this body should insist on that, insist on that, insist on that. Hallie, let me just give you a picture of uh, what we're told about how the talks went through the weekend into yesterday for those two Israelis uh, to be released, because it gives you a picture of, of how difficult these things are. A diplomat uh, close to the talks, with knowledge of the talks, tells me they were ongoing, but then Hamas on Saturday night was touching conditions that slowed them down a little and then complicated them. Then on Saturday night, Hamas announced names of the hostages and their ID numbers. That appears, according to a diplomat with knowledge of the talks, to have been an attempt to, to push the Israelis into, uh, force them into concessions. Actually, it had the opposite effect. And then with the help of the Egyptians, finally Hamas did agree to release those two hostages in any case. But that kind of uh, fraught and fragile negotiation gives you a picture of how difficult it must be now, particularly now that we're talking about a large group, many more potentially than two. That's right. And the Qataris have had such a central role here, Kier, for a number of reasons, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, Hamas has an office here, and uh, that has been a long-standing thing that the Israelis and the U.S. have known about. And part of the reason that the Qataris would say that they have agreed to that is for exactly this situation, so that they are able to mediate. That is the role that they are playing right now, talking directly, I'm told, to the Israelis and to Hamas, uh, and trying to navigate through these incredibly difficult circumstances to get... First of all, uh, the civilians out, the, the, those that were, uh, you know, generals or commanders for the, for the IDF, if those are not among the hostages, and we don't know exactly who the hostages are, there's, as, we, as we know, more than 200 of them, uh, the, they are likely to be held for longer. The civilians is what they're really talking about, and it is the Qataris that are at the centre of those tools. Kier, thank you. Hala, I want to go back to you here because the Israelis, um, some of these Israeli officials are furious by what they heard from the U.N. Secretary General about the potential for a ceasefire here. Let me play what the Israeli foreign minister had to say. What is a proportionate response for killing of babies, for rape women and burn them, for beheading of a child? How you can agree to a ceasefire? with someone who swore to kill and destroy your own existence. How? You hear all of the rage there from the Israeli foreign minister speaking on behalf of so many in his government there. Yes, uh, and you, but you also hear a lot of criticism coming from Antonio Guterres and others at the United Nations and others who believe that the Israeli suffering hasn't been highlighted in equal measure. Antonio Guterres, and this is what really enraged the foreign minister of Israel, he essentially said that there is a clear violation of humanitarian law in Gaza, and he said that Palestinians have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation 
occupation. This really, really angered the Israeli foreign minister to the point that he tweeted, without officially notifying apparently the UN Secretary General's office, tweeted that he would be canceling a meeting with Antonio Guterres. So that was a very, very tense meeting at the UN, and it's a meeting that highlights the divisions. It highlights in a microcosm here the divisions worldwide over the crisis and the war that's happening here in Gaza between Hamas and Israel. Holly? Hala, Kier, thank you both so much for being there and for that reporting. I want to bring in Matt Bradley now, who is a bit further north of where Hala was there in Israel in Lebanon. And Matt, it's civilians, as some of these tensions continue to escalate here, civilians who find themselves increasingly in the crosshairs of this fighting right along the border where you are, right? That's right. And now the United Nations is saying there's 20,000 people here on the Lebanese side who have been displaced. And on the Israeli side, we've already seen evacuations of some tens of thousands more, all of them avoiding what is not quite a war. You know, this is the interesting thing. I was at a school that's housing some of these displaced people here in Lebanon. And yeah, it was it was filled with people. There were lots of families in individual classrooms, and it's very problematic for the school because there's no longer school in session. The students only go once a week now. But And it wasn't great. It wasn't overcrowded. It wasn't where, you know, Hallie, you and I would want to be living, and it wasn't where these families wanted to be living. But the point is, this is happening before there's the outbreak of a full-on war here, which means that if there is a full-on war, things are going to get so much more desperate. And I mm. spoke with the administrator of this school, a local official, talking about the situation there. Here's what he told me. But if there's a full-on war here, can you handle thousands more people? It is hard. It is hard. We wish we would not reach this point, but it is hard. But even if it happened, we will still, we will still try. This is because there is no other way. Now, also, Hallie, the reason why people have so much anxiety about this and the reason why their minds all go to the worst case scenario is because they're remembering 2006. That's when the Israelis launched a full scale attack on Hezbollah here in Lebanon. And, you know, they even went all the way up and they were bombing a southern neighborhood of Beirut called Dahia. That's where that's a Hezbollah stronghold. And I want to read for you something that the president of Israel just said. He said, if Hezbollah will drag us into all into war, it should be clear that Lebanon will pay the price. Lebanon cannot be a sovereign member of the international community. It's citizens carrying a Lebanese passport. When it comes to attacking Israel, they are not responsible. This is by Israeli President Isaac Herzog. And, you know, the reason that he's saying this and the reason there's so much anxiety here about what Hezbollah will do next is because this is something that's actually in the Israeli war book, in their playbook. They call it the Dahia Doctrine. After that neighborhood I just mentioned, we were there last week for a Hezbollah rally. And this is because that neighborhood was bombed. And it's part of the doctrine here. If a nation mm -hmm. neighboring Israel or any nation raises arms against Israel, they will respond disproportionately. They will cripple the infrastructure of that nation, not just destroy Hezbollah, but they will destroy so much more that's part of that nation. You could call it collective punishment, which is a war crime. But this is the fact of the matter is they're trying to keep the Lebanese people from allowing Hezbollah to drag them into war. This country is still recovering from 2006, Sally. Matt Bradley, live for us there in southern Lebanon tonight. Matt, we're glad to have you there. Thank you. We are just learning tonight that two drone attacks on U.S. military bases in Iraq and Syria last week had more of an impact than was previously known, hurting something like two dozen U.S. service members. But those attacks now raising some concern that American troops and Americans living overseas could end up caught in the crossfire of a wider war. Right now, you know that there are some warships moving into the region, including a second aircraft carrier group that's set to arrive really any day. The mission for these destroyers and cruisers and carriers and jets for now is to bring a show of force that, in effect, scares off anybody, any actor, trying to take advantage now of the war between Israel and Hamas. That could change quickly, of course, if a big number of Americans need to escape, perhaps potentially an escalating war regionally. NBC's Courtney QB is joining us now. So talk to us here about sort of the, the quote-unquote intimidation factor of these strike groups moving in, but also the readiness piece of it as well and the humanitarian role that U.S. troops can play. 
So uh, there already is, as we just saw on that graphic on screen, there's already a pretty significant presence in the Eastern Med with the carrier strike group, the USS Ford. There's also a number of attack and fighter aircraft that have moved into the region. But what we've also seen is there's an additional number of, of um, a, a U.S. carrier strike group that's off the waters, off of uh, in the waters off of Iran. There's some air defense systems that have moved in. And there's also the USS Kearney, which is in the northern Red Sea. We haven't talked a whole lot about that. Uh, it, that was the ship that shot down at least four Houthi land attack cruise missiles, a number of drones that the U.S. is saying may have been headed towards Israel from Yemen. Now, that's in the northern Red Sea. And why that's important, Hallie, is because that ship uh, has the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit. That's about 2,000 Marines. One of the things that these Marines train for is a humanitarian evacuation, getting Americans out of a place when it's a contested environment. So that's a place where uh, even though, you know, our viewers may say, well, they're, they're not in the Mediterranean. Well, they're in the northern Red Sea, which means they're on the southern coast off of Israel. So they could deploy from there and then they could be supported by some of the ships and the aircraft in the eastern Mediterranean and throughout the region. Now, that being said, nothing has been ordered. And I have to say, the overall scale of what a humanitarian evacuation from Israel or from a number of other countries around there, it would be an enormous logistical undertaking. When you're talking about someplace like Israel, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500,000 Americans and dual citizens who could be at, who could be asking to get out of that country if need be. In addition to that, you can see from the map here, we have um, Jordan with about 5,000. Lebanon, you just heard from Matt Bradley, 86,000 potential people who would have to evacuate from there, another 60,000 in Egypt. It would be an enormous undertaking, Hallie. That is for sure. Courtney QB live for us at the Pentagon. I know you're juggling a lot. Uh, Court, thank you. We'll check back in with you, I know, in a little bit. So let's bring it back here to Washington now, just across from the river where Courtney is, to the Capitol, because there is a daily drama update tonight on the race for somebody, anybody, to become Speaker of the House. And the answer to that is we're going to know more maybe in about 45 minutes from now. That's because that is when... The Republican conference is going to head back behind closed doors after already spending the entire morning behind closed doors picking this guy, Tom Emmer, the number three Republican in the House right now, to be their nominee to become speaker. Guess what? That lasted for maybe three hours. He has now, as of late tonight, dropped out. He realized he didn't have the votes to get there. He didn't have the support from his conference to get there. So back to the drawing board again. Back to the drawing board for like the fourth time here in the last couple of weeks, this entire time that the House has not had a speaker. I want to bring in Sahil Kapoor joining us now for whatever the addition of tonight's situation is going to be over where you are, right? Congressional Groundhog Day, call it. The Emmer era lasted for about the blink of an eye. Part of what unraveled it was this issue of Donald Trump going up against him. It seemed like that was in many ways the breaking point here. I'm going to pull that thread in a second, but first, I just need the, like, 517 Eastern Time update from you. They're going back behind closed doors. They're going to try this whole thing again. What, what's up? Yeah, that is our expectation, Hallie. Tom Emmer became the third nominee of the Republicans for Speaker in three weeks to win that nomination and then wash out because he failed to get the necessary 217 votes out of 221 members uh, to get elected on the floor. This is a hurdle that... Uh, has bedeviled multiple of his predecessors who have gotten the nomination, including Kevin McCarthy, who could not hold on to that number, which is why he was evicted in the first place. Steve Scalise was the next nominee, failed to get the votes. Jim Jordan was the next nominee, failed to get the votes. Now Tom Emmer has failed to get the votes. And there are layers upon layers upon layers of bad blood uh, developing in the House Republican Conference with each iteration of this that is only making it more difficult for the conference to unify behind someone. So yes, they expect to go right behind closed doors like they have the last time, pick a nominee, and then it's going to be up to that nominee to get 217 votes. They've not been able to come up with any mechanisms to ensure that this doesn't continue happening, Hallie. Okay. The Trump factor, because Donald Trump came out today, posted about Tom Emmer, didn't think he was essentially conservative enough, quote unquote, for, for former President Trump. Remember, Tom Emmer's a guy um, who is one of the Republicans who voted to certify the legitimate results of the 2020 election. In other words, he didn't go along with the um, election fraud lie that Donald Trump was pushing. Donald Trump doesn't like that, right? It seems like that was in some ways kind of the tipping point where Emmer and his team realized, okay, we are not going to get to 217 with this kind of opposition from the former president who remains the de facto leader of the party. 
Yeah, that's a big part of it, Hallie. There were more than 25 uh, opponents of Tom Emmer when they had that subsequent ballot to hold a vote of confidence. More than 25 Republicans either voted no or present on Emmer, which indicated that he already had a steep hill to climb. And then the dagger came, of course, from former President Donald Trump, who interestingly yesterday told her colleague Dasha Burns that he was trying to stay out of the speaker battle, that, you know, he didn't have anything negative to say about Tom Emmer when he was asked about him, even though there had been reporting, including from our colleague Garrett Haig, that, you know, t uh, Trump world was not in favor of Tom Emmer. He didn't say anything yesterday. Trump waited until Emmer was nominated and then twisted the knife. Uh, which was some remarkable timing there by the former president. It only accentuated Emmer's problems. It's not clear he could have gotten there anyway, but that Trump movement, that Trump statement that he put out calling Emmer a globalist rhino, the pejorative acronym Republican in name only, uh, gave many you know, members a permission slip to either oppose Emmer or continue opposing him, which pretty much choked off his path, Hallie. How late do people need to stay up tonight if they want to know what, what the heck's going to happen with this speaker thing? We are expecting a candidate forum to happen. We don't know if they're going to be voting. We don't know if there's going to be a nominee. We don't know if that nominee is going to have the votes. It's bedlam here. So I would not advise anyone to, you know, to put a calendar reminder in terms of the next update because we just don't know when that's going to be, Hallie. I won't. Sahil, thank you. Let's get a weather update now with our first snowstorm of the winter season here already, even though it's not quite winter yet. But in Oregon, the fall foliage has fast forwarded into a winter wonderland. Kind of. Looks a little sloppy. By the time the snow stops, which could be as late as Thursday, some spots are expected to be buried in more than a foot of snow. I want to go right to meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, winter is coming. It's here. It's I know, this is, so where are you on the spectrum, Hallie? Because some people are like, yes, the first snow is coming. We get to go skiing. I just and all picked the a pumpkin yesterday. Like, so I'm not ready for this. I'm in, I'm in apple cider season, if you must know. All right. So you're, you, you, can, you can wait till January or maybe around Christmas time. Yeah, somewhere around that. That's like a lot of people. So you don't get that in the northwest, though, in the mountainous areas, in the northern Rockies. This is about on schedule when we expect the first snow. And this one will not be in Seattle or Portland. It will mostly be in all the mountainous areas. And then Montana is going to get nailed in Idaho all through the northern Rockies. There's the little curl here. This is the storm coming in. Not good travel this evening on I-5 with a lot of rainy weather. Heading through the passes is where you get the snow at the high elevations everywhere. In this darker reddish color, these are all winter storm warnings. So we're talking about Yellowstone, Jackson Hole. You know, the skiers are just drooling over this because a lot of these resorts haven't opened up yet. But after this storm, they probably will. So, you know, 9, 12 inches in some areas. Glendive could get 6 inches. Bismarck could get 3 to 6. And maybe your first flakes of the season expected tonight and tomorrow. Denver and also towards Minneapolis, Hallie. It's kind of weather whiplash here, right, as we're looking Oof. ahead to maybe a hot week and weekend for some other people. Yeah, uh, so all that warm weather is going to head to the east, so that's going to be one of the stories. And actually a dry weekend coming up, too, for the east coast. And, Hallie, we probably could have led this weather with this other story, because at 5 p.m. just minutes ago, the Hurricane Center told us that Otis is now a Category 3 hurricane expected to make landfalls a Category 4. This is a nightmare. This is a rapidly intensifying hurricane in a short period of time. Only three hours ago, it was a tropical storm, and it's heading for the population of Acapulco at about 1 million people. This is like the government is probably rushing. I'm sure we have American tourists that are there. Everyone is like, what? We're now all of a sudden going to be in the way of a Category 4 major hurricane. It'll make landfall tomorrow morning. Um, and it, remember, to the right of the centers where the worst storm surges and the highest winds, and that could possibly be the Acapulco Bay area here. So this is a developing, very dangerous, life-threatening situation that's uh, taking place in the next 12 hours here in the coastline of Mexico, Hallie. Yes, yesterday, this was only supposed to be a tropical storm at landfall. I was going to say. And this... Now they're getting a Category 4. Bill, we talked about it yesterday here on the show. I mean, we told people that this was happening, or at some point this week, this has blown up in a very Huge. significant way based on this. This could be, end up being one of the most destructive storms on the planet this hurricane season. I mean, that's how Jeez. dangerous this is going to be tonight for the people in that's Mexico. That's scary, Bill. Um, we're going to ask you to follow any updates and bring you back if you have any. Thank okay. you, sir. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show. The CDC is telling doctors that a medicine used to keep babies safe from this really contagious virus is in short supply. What options parents have, even as we start to hit that fall virus season? Plus, what happened when women across Iceland, even the prime minister, went on strike today? Look at that. Former President Trump's former fixer and current nemesis, if you will, in court today pointing the finger at Mr. Trump, accusing him of being personally responsible for lying about how much he's worth. We're talking about Michael Cohen, 
You see him here in a New York courtroom as part of a $250 million civil trial. He and Mr. Trump hadn't been in the same room together in five years. They've had this very public falling out. Listen to what Cohen said when he was asked outside. Michael, how do you feel to see Donald Trump again? Heck of a reunion. Heck of a reunion, he says. That reunion happening against the backdrop of this split screen. Yet another one of Mr. Trump's former attorneys pleading guilty in a case he's a defendant in, in Georgia. And what amounts to kind of whiplash from Jenna Ellis, who went from leading the charge on Mr. Trump's false election claims, his lies about election fraud, smiling in her mugshot, remember that? Now, tears in court, entering her guilty plea. I believe in and I value election integrity. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. She's getting five years of probation, a fine, and maybe most importantly, a requirement now that she has to testify at future hearings or trials in the case, meaning she could end up testifying against Donald Trump. NBC's Dasha Burns is outside court in New York. We've got two buckets here, right? Let's start with the Michael Cohen bucket, yep. Dasha, because this is in many ways a showdown that has been years in the making. Talk us through it and the significance of what Michael Cohen had to say, pointing the finger at Donald Trump. Yeah, Hallie, five years of bad blood spilling out into this courtroom here today. And in this testimony on the stand, Michael Cohen hitting really the heart of this case. Let me read to you some of what he said. He said, I was asked to increase the total assets upon a number that he, Donald Trump, arbitrarily elected. Whenever, whatever number Trump told us, saying later he would look at the total assets and say, I'm actually not worth $4.5 billion. I'm really worth more like six billion. He would ask Alan Weisselberg and I to go back to the office and return with the desired goal. Essentially, they're saying uh, what, what his argument is, what uh, the attorney general's argument is, is that Trump inflated his wealth, that he essentially gave Cohen a net worth goal to achieve, to reverse engineer the documents, to get to that number that he believed he was worth. That wasn't necessarily the true net worth. Now, upon cross-examination, Alita Hava, Trump's attorney, began that cross-examination this afternoon. She'll uh, continue tomorrow. Uh, she was quite hard on Cohen, and she did get him to admit that he lied in his 2018 guilty plea hearing, essentially undermining his, uh, his, his truth-telling, Hallie, and undermining him in front of the judge there. So, Dasha, that's the Michael Cohen of it all. Can you pivot a little bit and talk right. about what's happening further down south, right, in this Georgia election interference case with Jenna Ellis? Yeah. Because she's pleading guilty. She now becomes the third former Donald Trump attorney to plead guilty in this case. These are all people, remember, who were very much front and center mm -hmm. in those election fraud lies. I mean, Jenna Ellis was there during that now infamous you know, Rudy Giuliani hair dye press conference that I think people probably remember. It could be potentially very significant now for the former president to have at least three people who were working with him on an attorney-client basis, right, to potentially testify against him here. Yeah, no one could forget that hair dye dripping. Look, this is likely going to really strengthen the prosecution's case here. She has pled guilty to aiding and abetting false statements and writings. At the heart of this, Hallie, uh, she was claiming that hundreds of thousands of votes were uh, made illegally, uh, thousands of illegal votes, it really it, it, as part of a, a campaign to get lawmakers in Georgia to appoint false elector. She has pled guilty to this. Instead of getting jail time here, she got probation, which is certainly going to look appealing to some others who have been charged in this case, which could mean that that number of people you mentioned, the four, could turn into five, could turn into six. So okay. could be a concern uh, for Trump and his legal team. Uh, of course, for in the New York case, in the Georgia case, in all of these cases, he has uh, claimed he is innocent and that this is a witch hunt. We continue to hear uh, that messaging from Trump and his team, Hallie. That's right. Three of his former attorneys pleading guilty, four people overall. And as you point out, who knows how many more? Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the eight Ohio police officers involved in the death of Jalen Walker last year are now back on active duty, according to officials. You'll remember they shot and killed Walker, a 25-year-old black man, after a chase via car and on foot.
An attorney for Walker's family is telling one of our affiliates tonight the family is, in their words, saddened by the way in which they continue to be ignored by the city of Akron. A grand jury had decided against indicting any of the officers involved. Number two, the Writers Guild of America getting slammed now by some of its members for not coming out with a statement condemning Hamas's terror attack on Israel this month. The WGA East says it has a lot of journalists and didn't want to hurt their work with a statement. The Writers Guild of America West is apologizing today to its members, saying commenting on the Israel-Hamas war felt outside of its scope as a labor union in this country. Number three, dozens of states, like more than 40 of them, so almost all the states in this country are suing Meta, claiming the company is hurting the mental health of kids. Remember, Meta, of course, is the parent company of Facebook, Instagram. The states say that these apps, these platforms, have addictive features specifically aimed at kids and at teenagers. Meta says it is committed to safety and that it's added tools to support kids. Number four, today, tens of thousands of women in Iceland, including the prime minister, look at this, going on a 24-hour strike. You can see a lot of them here in the capital. They want an end to pay disparities and to gender-based violence. You saw schools, shops, banks, all shutting down today as the strike went down. Number five, how old do you think the moon is? Well, scientists behind a new study say it's 40 million years older than we thought meaning it formed maybe four and a half billion years ago. This is based on the analysis of samples taken from the moon back during the Apollo 17 mission. So a little trivia factoid for you there. Here's another one. The CDC tonight is warning they're starting to run out of an important medicine given to babies to prevent RSV right at a moment when cases are starting to go up. So now you have pediatricians being advised to prioritize doses of this drug. It's called Bayfortis to babies with the highest risk of getting very, very sick from RSV. The drug company says they had more demand than they thought they were going to see and that they're working with their manufacturer to, I'm quoting them here, to accelerate additional supply. In other words, to try to get more of this stuff out to the people who need it. Remember, RSV is a really contagious respiratory virus. It mostly affects little kids, older people, people with weaker immune systems. Every year it puts 80,000 people in the hospital and kills 300 children under the age of five. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now. So, Dr. Patel, RSV is very serious. Yeah. I think any parent knows mm -hmm. that that's like a thing you, you really want to try to make sure your baby doesn't get. Now we're hearing this warning from the CDC. Talk to us about right. what parents should know, what pediatricians are doing. Yeah, so unfortunately, this is one of the first times we've ever had access to an immunization for RSV. So we should celebrate and applaud that. However, this shortage has created such a demand, and there's such limited supply, that essentially pediatricians are rationing this. And what they're doing is trying to ration this for babies under the age of six months especially that could be at higher risk born prematurely chronic conditions other things like that any parent kind of listening and watching though should talk to their pediatrician and try to understand because they are making a commitment to expand its supply why was it such a surprise that the demand would be so high and right. that the supply wasn't able to match it here I, I wish I could tell you we've learned from past lessons COVID all sorts of things but I think people just kind of don't know well look there's gonna be all these educated families that have now been told by the American Academy of Pediatrics right. by people like us talking about it. Go get this. Go get this immunization. This is really going to help save lives. So what did any parent do that's concerned? They did that. And I think that the company and pediatricians offices were caught off guard and pediatricians have to pay for this to hold it in inventory. And it can be about three hundred dollars. So it can be expensive. I noticed that you stopped yourself from saying vaccine. Yes, you said not. immunization instead. Right. There's a distinction here. There's a distinction. So technically this is an immunization because it provides man-made antibodies in the form of monoclonal antibodies to fight RSV. It's different than a mechanism of a vaccine like the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine. The outcome is the same. It okay. The illness. Well, a little technical, but we like yes, to hear it. That's right. Looking back, sort of big picture, here we are. We're in the fall season. Right. Any, any parent with a kid in school knows yeah. this is when the kids are getting sick, right? That's they're, right. They're all getting these. How does the whether you want to call it vaccination or immunization picture look right now for right. everything. Right now, low uptake on flu and COVID vaccines, to be honest. So we'd like to see more parents out there getting their kids vaccinated for the things we do have plenty supply of, and that's COVID and flu shots. But we are seeing an uptick in these illnesses and hospitalizations, just like we did last year, including Dr. RSV. Dr. Kavita Patel, it is a good information to have. Yep. Thank you Thank for you. being here with us. Coming up on the show, a whole lot more, including what else we're learning about that off-duty pilot accused of trying to bring down an airplane the psychedelic he allegedly may have taken just days before that flight. Plus, the manhunt in Massachusetts for a military vet accused of killing his wife. Stay with us.
Right now, the search is on for an Air Force veteran thought to be armed and dangerous, suspected of killing his wife in Massachusetts. Right now, state and local police are looking through hundreds of acres of woods in the town of Gardner. This is about 40 miles northwest of Worcester. This is where officials think he is. It's where they found his car. Aaron Pennington is accused of murdering his 30-year-old wife. First responders found her dead in the couple's bedroom, apparently shot in the face. The two have four little kids. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis here, talk through some of the details of what we know about this, what we know about uh, this suspect here. It's pretty horrifying, particularly for this couple's children. What we know about the suspect, let me put up a full screen for you of who police say this man is. 33 years old, 6 feet 2 inches tall, 175 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. What happened that, that day? Sunday morning, they say, according to the police, the four young children, ages 2, 5, 7, and 9, ran to a neighbor's house crying, saying they couldn't find their father, and their mother was in in the bedroom, locked in a bedroom, and crying. They couldn't get to her. What they did, the police also said, was that a neighbor notified authorities that the suspect's BMW, white BMW, was seen leaving the family home's driveway around 8.50 in the morning. When police reached the home, as you point out, they found the mother in an upstairs bedroom. She had been shot in the face. They found shell casings, but they found no weapon. At this point, they believe that the suspect is armed and dangerous. And what they're saying is the fact that he also has a military background. In a Q&A this afternoon with authorities at a press conference, that question was brought up in terms of what impact it could have in this investigation. Take a listen. Mr. Pennington has a military background. Do you think he has the skill set to survive in the woods? Well, you, you know, that's part of the training. The, those are the questions that the state police have been asking, and they're finding out exactly what training he would have had, wouldn't have had. Yes, that is part of the equation. And authorities say if you see him, do not engage. Instead, uh, notify authorities because, again, they believe he's armed and dangerous. Hallie? There was a shelter in place right in town. It has since been lifted. So that was in place over the course of the last day or here. Um, and I have to imagine that this is just so incredibly upsetting, obviously, to people who live in this community. It is uh, disturbing beyond compare. In fact, listen to what some of the residents of the area say about this whole tragedy. I'm horrified. It's never had anything like this. It's such a gentle town, by and large. Kind of petrifying, to be honest with you. Like I said, it's fairly quiet around here. People are friendly. In fact, the friendliness of this community wanted people to come out and have a vigil for the mother, Brianne, who was killed. But the mayor of the town says that he wants them to hold off on that for now because, again, the suspect is still at large. They believe he is armed and dangerous, and they don't want to put anyone else in potentially in harm's way. Hallie. Rahima Ellis, thank you for being on top of this one for us tonight. I appreciate it. Some new and startling details late today about that off-duty pilot being charged with attempted murder after allegedly trying to bring down a plane. He says he took magic mushrooms. He was on shrooms, essentially, 48 hours beforehand for the first time, according to the state criminal complaint. Here he was appearing in court just within the last couple of minutes here. This is new video just into us. Something also mentioned in this federal criminal complaint that the pilot, Joseph Emerson, talked with investigators about having taken these psychedelics, these shrooms, before he caught a ride in the cockpit's jump seat during this flight from Washington to California. The complaint says he told police after it happened that he'd been having a nervous breakdown, that he hadn't slept for 48 hours, for, excuse me, for 40 hours, saying he didn't feel okay. It seemed like the pilots weren't paying attention to what was going on. So what did he do? He allegedly says, I'm quoting here from the complaint, I pulled both emergency shutoff handles because I thought I was dreaming and I just want to wake up. He wasn't able to pull the handles down all the way. And after he left the cockpit, he told a flight attendant, you need to cuff me right now or it's going to be bad. I want to bring in justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney. Just extraordinary details that we're yeah. getting from this, um, this complaint here, Ken. I'll give you some more. After he left the cockpit, according to the, one of the documents, he tried to open the emergency exit the, of the plane. Of the plane. Wow. Yep. A flight attendant stopped him. The new information we're getting just moments ago from new court documents is that he's told police that he had been depressed for six years and he had just lost his best friend. Um, and he had acknowledged that he was mentally not in a good place. Uh, nonetheless, these are incredibly serious acts that he allegedly tried to commit and, and the, obviously the criminal justice system taking it very seriously. I don't know if we have an answer to this, Ken, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if he says he took 
shrooms 48 hours before this flight. Was he, did he show uh, like an appearance of still being intoxicated? Do we know about that or is that a question mark? There is a quote from one of the officers in one of these court documents that said he did not appear to be intoxicated, but we're talking about psychedelic drugs here. So it's not, it's not like alcohol. It's not clear that an officer would detect that necessarily. We just showed some of that new video of him in court because he now faces more than 80 counts of attempted homicide, mm -hmm. essentially among other things here. What, what's next for this court process for him? What does he face? So so attempted murder in Oregon carries a mandatory seven attempted and a half murder, year yeah. sentence uh, uh, per count, and then he's got this federal charge on top of that. So, unless there's some kind of insanity plea here, he looks like he's facing a you know, significant prison sentence in this case. Is there any indication, and the answer may be no, that there is going to be any kind of action taken after this in order to restrict who may be able to kind of catch a ride in those cockpit jump seats, or is this an instance where if somebody is a pilot, right, who's yeah allowed to fly a plane that they kind of get the ability to be able to catch it. This is the thing that we're getting from aviation sources, that pilots are some of the most scrutinized people in the world, yeah. right? They've had background checks. That, so it's that it's really hard to go beyond what's already being done. You know, it's really hard to account for people that just have a mental breakdown, I guess, is the bottom line. Candelanian, thank you. Just a, a really a wild story there. I yeah. appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, Louisiana State Police say seven people are dead, more than two dozen hurt after that huge pileup on a highway yesterday. Remember, we told you about it last night. This is when this super fog happened, this really thick fog and smoke mixed together. We now know, according to police, that 158 cars and trucks were involved in this crash. It stretched something like a mile long. Out of our Western Bureau, the mayor of Maui County says all of West Maui is set to reopen to tourists starting next Wednesday. Some of the burned out sections of historic Lahaina will stay shut down. Travelers haven't been able to go there since, of course, that absolutely horrific wildfire incinerated much of that area back in August. It was the deadliest wildfire in this country in more than a century. Also out of our Southern Bureau, former Olympic gymnast Mary Lou Retton is now back at home in Houston, Texas, after she was in the hospital with pneumonia, according to people close to her. Earlier this month, she'd been in intensive care. She apparently couldn't breathe on her own, but her daughter now says that Retton is in recovery mode. Coming up, the new tech trying to make schools safer. We'll show you how it works. Late today, the New York Police Department is announcing they've seen a 7% increase in hate crimes since the start of the Israel-Hamas war more than two weeks ago. There's also a terror nexus concern, with the NYPD's top expert in that arena saying she's been asked if kids should still be going to school in light of what's happening in the Middle East. She says yes. But it's those concerns that are the backdrop for security ramping up across the country right now. And these may be conversations you're having with the people you love, too. How do you stay safe? What do you do at that crowded concert? How prepared is your kid's school? One app, born out of a nightmare, is now trying to get communities ready in the event of a worst-case scenario. NBC's Tom Winter has more. Our country is no stranger to violence in places we once considered safe with shooting. 17 people have lost their lives in this school shooting. After shooting. Yeah, shooting this one taking the lives of 18 children along with three adults. History, after uh, shooting. We have been told that the number of shooting victims is uh, around 20. Kids. America's future killed in their classrooms. Now parents are trying to do something, anything to try and help them. My daughter was Alyssa Alhadav, who was tragically murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14, 2018. Alyssa was only 14 years old. Lori Alhadav says she tried to help Alyssa during the shooting. I texted my daughter, Alyssa. I told her to run and hide. That help was on the way. And unfortunately, that help didn't arrive fast enough. Now she's pushing for the passing of Alyssa's law. It mandates that a panic button type device is in every classroom to give teachers and kids a chance. So once that button is pushed, everyone that has the panic button on their phone or in their classroom, on their computer, they will know that there is a medical emergency or an active shooter situation. Technology companies are pushing out different types of app-based buttons. One company says they've developed a tool born out of that very same tragedy. Go back to February 14th, 2018, <laughs> Parkland Massacre. Parkland's literally in our backyard, mm -hmm. where I'm from, 
I actually was right nearby that scene that happened that day. And I'll never forget the sirens, the lights, the police. Raffaro says his app called Safer Watch can let a school and law enforcement know right away that there's trouble. So let me give you a real life example. There's an armed individual jump over a school fence. Principal took out Safer Watch, pressed the panic button. That instantly notified everyone on campus to go that there's an emergency taking place, actually locked down the school. Simultaneously, that alert from Safer Watch goes to 911. That person was apprehended. Here's how it works. I pop this app open, you say, and I hit this button right here and say it, it's an active shooter. And you say, hold this down for three seconds? Yes. Okay. So it's instantly notifying law enforcement, and they're able to instantly see who reported the emergency, exactly where it's happening. You can see it knows exactly where in the building that we are. It knows the incident type. It knows the name of the school. Right, and I have the option here. If I don't want a phone call because something's happening in my classroom, my office, wherever it is, I can say do not contact, or I can say, hey, I want somebody to call me. I need some help. Exactly. Okay. You can decide your own contact preference depending on the situation that's happening. Everything directly in the app. Click send message and you can upload a media file, record audio, or send a photo. First responders are actually seeing what you're seeing. So when they're arriving on scene, they're more prepared and they're able to take, take the appropriate action. Safer Watch isn't law enforcement. They say they act as a conduit between police and people reporting a possible crime. Safer Watch says it's working with all sorts of large public events so people can report something suspicious and be told when an emergency is underway and what to do. Something people are keeping in mind during this heightened threat environment. It's a system Aladev says is in place in the school district where she is the chair of the board. And Alyssa's law is now enacted in five states. It helps to honor my daughter, Alyssa, keep her memory alive. And every time that panic button is pushed, I know that Alyssa is saving lives. I want to bring in Tom Winter now. Tom, what about parents who might be concerned about privacy for their kids on these kinds of apps and this app in particular? Walk that through. Sure, Hallie. So SaferWatch says that the data they don't collect it. So if you're uh, reporting a potential tip or a suspicious photo of an individual, that information goes directly to your local law enforcement agency. They hold on to the data. They have their own policies. It's not something that they keep. If there is um, and there were to be, God forbid, some kind of an incident, can this app... Um, do something after something happens, right? Or is it more uh, on the front end? Right, Hallie. So one of the things that Safer Watch and some of these other apps tout is the ability to let people know that there is an emergency. So whether it be a, a large concert, public gathering, or a large school campus, the idea behind this, and one of the things that they say is such a compelling case for having these types of applications, is that not only can people report things that are suspicious that are, or that are going on, but in fact can also be told what to do, that there is something going on, and perhaps some additional action to take where to go, what to avoid that type of thing. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Got it. Still to come here on the show, people protesting at the headquarters of Google in L.A. saying self-driving cars threaten their jobs and their safety. Why they're so worried and what Google's saying now. Next. We are just learning late tonight that California is suspending GM's self-driving cars there starting ASAP. Why? Why is this happening? Well, because of safety concerns that have come up since the cars got approved back in August to do like robo taxi things around San Francisco. It is safety concerns that are also behind a rally happening today against Google's self-driving cars in Southern California. These are Waymo cars that have been on this tour across LA that lets people ride in these, you know, robo cars as the company starts testing the waters for the launch of its own robo taxi service. Think Uber, but the car drive drives itself, basically. Our correspondent from NBC LA, Michelle Vias, has more. Outside the headquarters of Google here in Venice, our Teamsters and local leaders fighting for what they say is a looming threat of jobs and safety. They're against the self-driving cars that have made their way out to the streets here in Los Angeles. Waymo, hand down! Hand down! This issue is an absolute safety issue. I represent the firefighters in San Francisco. Some of the things that they've come across recently is a driverless car dragging a woman for several blocks wow. parked in front of a fire station so we cannot get out. 
Soon, Angelinos will be experiencing what the drivers of San Francisco and Phoenix already have, and that is self-driving cars. Plenty of mixed reviews, but there is a wait list out there for Angelinos to try out these cars. Waymo is an Alphabet-owned autonomous driving technology company with a mission, they say, to make it safe and easy for people to get to and from. Their research claims there are 50 million injuries and over 1 million deaths worldwide due to human errors like speedy, phone distractions, fatigue, and drunk driving. Adding, we appreciate that people have different viewpoints and encourage them to learn more about the positive impacts that Waymo's autonomous ride hailing is having on safety, accessibility, and sustainability. It is an uphill battle, but we're going to continue to fight this fight because th what's right is right, and that's the safety of our communities. And it's a no-brainer for these politicians. If they, want to con if they want to continue to support big tech and not the people, we're going to vote them out. Teamsters basically calling the rollout of self-driving cars reckless. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported that in 2021, Waymo had the most automated driving system crashes of any self-driving company. They say they will continue to fight for their jobs and for the safety of drivers out on the road. In Venice, Michelle Bias, NBC4 News. All right, thanks to Michelle for that reporting. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. Tonight, more anger, louder voices with this hostage crisis stretching on. Calls to action now from terrified family members and from some governments around the world. What they want to see happen now to try to get the people of these Israeli families kidnapped by Hamas home safely. Plus, back here in Washington, a lot of new developments even late tonight on the whole speaker drama happening for House Republicans. As we speak this hour, they are starting a brand new meeting with a brand new list of people who want that job. We're going to bring you up to speed on the latest in just a sec. Plus, Mother Nature tonight saying she is not done with hurricane season. A powerful hurricane heading toward Mexico as we speak. It could be one of the most destructive this year. We're live with the track. Then a showdown years in the making between former President Donald Trump and his former fixer. The testimony from Michael Cohen, the prosecutors hope could be the smoking gun proving their case. And the manhunt is on for an Air Force veteran accused of murdering his wife. My police worry he could turn his military survival skills into a long stretch on the run. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight more pressure, more anger now aimed really everywhere from world leaders and families of those taken hostage in this war between Israel and Hamas to try to get people kidnapped by those Hamas terrorists back home safely. We saw some families speaking outside the United Nations here in this country a little earlier, saying they need to see some action now. Watch. We will tell you 18 days, you don't know if that loved one is alive, dead, getting fed where he slept. Children, the mothers, the elderly, these hostages needs to be back yesterday, not tomorrow, yesterday. Bring them back. The Israeli foreign minister speaking there had some people in the crowd shouting the Hebrew word for shame at him. They want to see more done. Watch. Of the 7th of October. They wanted to know why the Israeli government couldn't do more to prevent that Hamas attack back on October 7th, when terrorists, of course, massacred more than 1,000 people in Israel. That rally being held with some 200-plus hostages still in the hands of Hamas, even as we learn more now about what exactly it's like to be held captive by them. Yocheved Lifshitz, you see her here in this image taken from a Hamas video as she is handed over to the Red Cross. She is one of the two women released in just the last 24 hours, along with Nareet Cooper. Now, Lifshitz, speaking publicly, says she went through hell when she was abducted. Her daughter, translating some of what she described to reporters outside a hospital in Tel Aviv. While she was being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks by Shabbat. Yeah, Shabbat people. You see her, you hear her there describing Shabab people, presumably referencing the Al Shabab group designated as a terrorist organization by the U.S. This comes as there is an intensifying focus, of course, on the region and specifically on what's happening in Gaza, with health officials there saying their hospitals could go out of service any minute now, putting a lot of lives at risk because they do not have enough fuel to keep things running. 
The U.N. says aid workers are going to have to stop operations by tomorrow night if they don't get that fuel ASAP. We've got to cover from every angle. Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv for us. Keir Simmons in Qatar. Matt Bradley is in Lebanon. Hala, I want to start with you here first. Um, can we talk about what we know about the experience of these hostages now released and in these extraordinary moments, talking about what life was like for them while they were in the hands of these terrorists? Yes, and presumably these hostages are being debriefed uh, on the Israeli side in order to gain clues as to where the more than 200 uh, detained uh, Israelis and dual nationals and uh, civilians as well as military personnel are being held inside the Gaza Strip. Now, you mentioned Yoshevid Lifshitz. She's the 85-year-old, uh, one of two elderly women released yesterday. She talked about her abduction from the kibbutz, but also talked about this intricate spider web network of underground tunnels in in Gaza uh, where she was held for more than two weeks. She says she was treated pretty well. She says she was given food and uh, that uh, those who were uh, uh, who were injured were were given medical care. Um, there, there was that image of her shaking the hand of one of the Hamas militants who handed her over to the Red Cross uh, workers who then eventually helped her across the border into Egypt. But we do know that the husbands of those two elderly women are still detained. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli military, is uh, uh, dropping leaflets over Gaza, asking ordinary Gazans to help them locate hostages, that they'll be compensated for it and that they could do this anonymously, though, and clear what the logistics of that would look like. And the big question, of course, going forward is whether more hostage releases will take place. There, there are talks of bigger groups, potentially, uh, that, that the release of bigger groups is being discussed. But that is still, at this point, uh, very much uh, does not seem imminent. And there seem to be some holdups with regards to those discussions, Hallie. Hala, I'm going to ask you to stand by. Kira, what would have to happen to make that more imminent, right? Do we have any sense of that as you are there in Qatar on that? Well, I mean, the talks are going to need to continue. I'm being told uh, by a diplomat with knowledge of the talks that they are positive. There isn't a breakdown. There is no, at the same time, no breakthrough. And that there is the conversation happening about how you move from releasing, you know, two hostages and then two hostages again to a, to a lot more hostages. Uh, there are a number of civilians in amongst the more than 200 who are being held. And it's those that we're talking about, 50, 60, maybe 70. It's not exactly clear, and this doesn't make it easy, uh, exactly clear where... Uh, the hostages are, or necessarily who all of them are. So it, it's very difficult. We found in the past few days, just for those two that we saw released, Hali, we, we found over the past few days that Hamas made demands uh, publicly that Israel was refused. Then Hamas backed down. It seems as if, according to a diplomat I spoke to, that that was an attempt to sort of pressure Israel. Uh, and, and then finally the release happened. Happened, though, it seems, across the Egyptian border, Rafa crossing, not uh, straight into Israel. Again, another sign, perhaps, of just how difficult this is. So just think about that. Uh, you know, multiply it by 10, by, 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 by 20, uh, in terms of numbers of people. And you get a picture of just how challenging this is going to be. Just to be clear, there will be negotiations over the diplomacy with the Qataris here, the Israelis, Hamas, the U.S. will be very much closely involved. And then the International Red Crescent or International Red Cross will go in to actually do the logistics of, of bringing people out when that happens. But when that happens is still a question. There is also this sense of urgency, and Hala and Kier, you both know this. Kier, I'll direct this to you. What one, um, the father of an American who is being held hostage, it's believed, had to say outside here where we are in, in, uh, in, in the U.S., in New York today. Watch. We demand that the U.N. and all the countries that are involved, and there are 33 different countries with the hostages, will get involved and work together, hand in hand, condemning what happened there, and bring our kids back. There is such an urgency to this cure as well. I mean, this is for so many people a desperate situation. Yeah.
There is, of course. And also, let's remember that this is all happening within the polarized world, within that context that we have uh, known about and talked about so many times, Hanny, on the show in the years in the years past, as we talked about the international picture. Well, well now, of course, this is all unfolding in that same uh, context. You actually had the Emir of, of Qatar uh, today saying, we say, enough. Israel shouldn't be granted an unconditional green light, an unrestricted authorization to kill. So, so that's the Emir of Qatar saying that, even as the Qatar Qataris are involved in negotiations to try and release hostages. Meanwhile, Israel and the U.S. saying those hostages have to be released without any demands, without any kind of quid pro quo. Take a listen to the Secretary of State today. Their loved ones must be released immediately, unconditionally. And every member of this council, indeed, every member of this body should insist on that, insist on that, insist on that. Even then, uh, Halle, that happening as uh, Israeli foreign minister called up for the resignation of the Secretary General of the UN uh, for the fact that he had said that all, none of this had happened in a vacuum, referring to the, to the Palestinians. So again, yeah. uh, th there are divisions around the world as well as divisions in Israel. Kier, thank you. Hal, let me go back to you here because all of this, of course, the specter looming over all of this is when that Israeli full-on ground attack may happen into Gaza. We know there have obviously continued to be airstrikes in Gaza. There, there continues to be that humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We saw today the Israeli prime minister talking with his troops today where he says they are facing the next stage, right? I mean, there is every preparation now that they will continue to, at some point, we don't know when, but at some point, push forward with that potential ground incursion. Yes, and uh, there have been denials coming from the Israeli prime minister's office that there are divisions within the cabinet. For instance, there were reports that uh, there were disagreements, major disagreements, between the Israeli prime minister and his minister of defense, Yoav Gallant, as to when to go in, how hard to go in. Uh, but it seems as though perhaps uh, some pressure applied from President Biden on the Israeli prime minister to delay a ground incursion to allow for some space, some oxygen, uh, to, um, to allow for the release of more hostages, that perhaps that's having an impact, um, and uh, also to allow more aid to go through, although uh, it, 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 potentially from the Israeli perspective that's not a motivating factor, but there is pressure, and there is also just this constant stream of diplomatic visits from heads of state. The latest was the French president today, and so long as that happens, it seems as though so a, a ground incursion is not imminent at this stage. Back to you, Hala. Hala Garani, Keir Simmons, thank you both so much for being there live for us in the region tonight. Also live for us in the region is Matt Bradley in southern Lebanon for us. So, Matt, talk through a little bit the situation that people, um, civilians essentially, are finding themselves in. I know that there have been evacuations for a number of places there along the border. You're having the opportunity to speak with people on the ground. Talk us through it. Yeah, I went to a school that's now kind of an ad hoc sort of internally displaced people's camp. And, you know, the, according to the United Nations, there's now nearly 20,000 people who are displaced in southern Lebanon. And actually, across the border in Israel, there's some tens of thousands who have been evacuated from the border areas. So we went to this school. Uh, the situation wasn't desperate. It was about one family per classroom. And, you know, that's pretty bad. That's not how you and I would want to live, and it's not how these people would choose to live. But the issue here, Hallie, is that there hasn't been a full outbreak of war here. This has not broken out into a massive Israeli invasion or a tit-for-tat huge launching of missiles. That is yet to come. And already, according to the UN, as I mentioned, nearly 20,000 internally displaced people, they're all girding for much, much worse and for an exodus of refugees, internally displaced people, heading into camps like the one I saw or up north. Uh, and I spoke with one of the administrators, a local official who was running this school. Here's what he told me. But if there's a full-on war here, can you handle thousands more people? It is hard. It is hard. We wish we would not reach this point, but it is hard. But even if it happened, we will still, we will still try. This is because there is no other way. And the reason why, Hallie, everybody, when they think about this, they always go back to 2006, their minds immediately. That's when there was a huge war between Hezbollah and Israel that lasted for more than a month. And that's something that everybody is worried about here. 
zooming out a bit now, right, this idea of an international coalition proposed by the French president here to try to fight Hamas. Um, how much traction is that getting or how realistic would that be? Yeah, I mean, that was a curious comment today by Emmanuel Macron when he was making the rounds and he was meeting with the Israeli prime minister and others. You know, he was saying that he wanted to expand the international coalition that's currently fighting ISIS. Now, that kind of dovetails with what we've been hearing from Israeli officials who have been taking pains and repeating over and over and over again that Hamas is just ISIS. They're trying to make that equivalency. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't sound as though Emmanuel Macron's idea was necessarily all that thought out. He didn't give any specifics. And according to Reuters news agency, his office said that it would just be inspired by the coalition against the Islamic State. Howie. Matt Bradley in Lebanon for us tonight. Thank you. Two drone attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria last week. More of an impact than we previously knew about, with the concerns raising some fears that U.S. soldiers and citizens and Americans living in the region could end up caught in the crossfire of a bigger war. Right now, these U.S. warships are gathering in the region. There's the second aircraft carrier group set to arrive really any day. And the mission here for the destroyers and cruisers and jets that you see here for now is to bring this kind of show of force to scare off anybody trying to take advantage of the chaos between Israel and Hamas. That could change fast, though. Of course, if a big number of Americans need to get out of some kind of rapidly escalating war in the region, if this does expand. I want to bring in NBC's Courtney Kuby, who is joining us now. Pull back the curtain with the reporting that you're working on here, Court, and the people that you're talking to at the Pentagon, how much they are thinking about the potential for perhaps evacuations down the road, how much that is sort of a plan D rather than a plan B. Walk us through it. So a big part of what you just saw showed on screen there, the U.S. military that's in the region that's, and that's being moved into the region, a big part of the region that they're going is yes for deterrence, yes for a show of support and, and, for, and uh, defenses for the region. But another piece of that is for this potential. If Americans have to be brought out of Israel or even any of a number of uh, countries around Israel, those military forces there could support. One of the main efforts would most likely be from a Marine Expeditionary Unit, the 26th Mew. It is um, in the northern uh, Red Sea on the USS Kearney. One of the things that a Marine Expeditionary Unit, or a Mew, trains for is a non-combatant evacuation. So they have uh, the training to go into a place, especially if it's a contested or dangerous environment, and provide security and get Americans to safety. One of the options, it may not be one of the primary options, but one of the potential options would even be in a, a pinch, they could take Americans and put them on some of the ships in the Eastern Mediterranean. So all of that is something that, that the Pentagon has been working on since October 7th. In fact, when the Ford first went forward into the Eastern Mediterranean, that's the carrier strike group that's there now, one of the things officials were telling me that weekend was they wanted to be prepared should there need to be a, 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 an evacuation of Americans from Israel or even from the region. That's so interesting. Courtney Kuby, we're glad to have you there live for us at the Pentagon. Thank you. Thank right you. now, let's talk about what else is happening in Washington, because it relates to, do we have a Speaker of the House? The answer is no. Will we get a Speaker of the House? The answer is, we don't know. Like, we'll, we'll probably get one. We just don't know when, because right now, as we speak, within the last, we think, 15 minutes, House Republicans are back at it, back at the drawing board now, meeting behind closed doors with a brand new list of candidates who are trying to become the next speaker. You see on the left there, three of the people running now who already ran, hoping to now get enough votes, at least in the internal conference setting. Some new candidates, three of them, on the right side of your screen are jumping into the ring as well, hoping to get into the mix here. And if you're like, well, wait a second, Hallie, didn't I just hear earlier today that there was another meeting behind closed doors where Republicans were gonna try to figure out who they wanted to be speaker? You did. They decided this morning, Nominating this guy, Tom Emmer, right? He's currently the number three House Republican. He was the speaker nominee for all of maybe four hours, and then he withdrew. He dropped out when he realized he just didn't have the votes to get the job. So here we go, back to the drawing board. Um, it has been a journey. It will continue to be, clearly, a journey. Sahil Kapoor is joining us now for the journey. Uh, any sense of what is happening now inside this meeting? This is typically a forum, right, where the candidates will talk about what their vision is, why they want to lead the conference, and then will they vote tonight? Will that happen tomorrow? And I'm talking internally. We're still many steps away from an actual House floor vote here, which is the actual real deal. 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie. It feels like Groundhog's Day twice in one day now, where Republicans are accelerating this process. Uh, the third speaker nominee in the last three weeks washed out today. That was Tom Emmer, met the same fate as Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan when he failed to get the vote. So now Republicans are back at it in a conference meeting, their second one of the day, uh, for another candidate forum. And yes, these are just forums where they hear from the various candidates who are running. Let's put the list of, of six names back up. There are three who matter and three who are definitely underdogs. The, the new candidates are less likely to, to you know, be major factors here. The ones on the left, I would keep my eyes on Mike Johnson. He was the runner-up to Tom Emmer the last time. Actually came quite close. There's Kevin Hearn, the chair of the Republican Study Committee, has been flirting with a speaker bid ever since Kevin McCarthy was evicted and Byron Donalds. The Freedom Caucus underdog who is uh, well-liked by particularly the Florida delegation, which is a large one. He's gotten endorsements there. So we don't really know where this goes. They need a nominee, and that nominee, again, has to win 217 out of 221 votes. Unclear, he, uh, you know, Mike Johnson, if he wins it, can do that. Unclear, any of these men can do that. As we were talking last hour, Hallie, there are layers of bad blood within the Republican conference with each new iteration of the speaker fight. Each new failed candidate has left a new faction aggrieved. There is, I think, a, a consideration of the Trump factor here, it seems, because Donald Trump isn't down with Tom Emmer as speaker. And Donald Trump made that exceptionally clear today. And you wonder why? Well, listen, there are, as you say, a spectrum of voices on the Republican Party. Emmer is part of the small group of Republicans who ended up voting to certify the legitimate results of the 2020 election. In other words, he bucked the lie that Donald Trump was trying to sell about election fraud. Um, here's what Donald Trump had to say today about this whole Emmer situation. Listen. I absolutely must have had an impact because as soon as I did the I mean, that's that is in many ways, Sahil, Donald Trump trying to flex some muscle and take some credit for Emmer dropping out. How much truth is there to that and how much of a factor is the former president's endorsement? It was a factor, Hallie. It's not clear that was the decisive factor, because tr before Trump even came out with that statement, more than 25 Republicans uh, basically voted no confidence in Tom Emmer after the post-nomination ballot in conference. And then he met with a bunch of them, tried to win them over, failed to do that. Then Trump's statement came in. It certainly did not help. It gave a lot of those Republican critics of Tom Emmer a permission slip to continue opposing him. Some of them suddenly became more public, and then Emmer uh, dropped out. So it hastened the process, I'll say. But it's you know not clear Tom Emmer would have had the votes either way. And the other thing, Hallie, I want to mention, um, a speakerless House has very real consequences for regular people. It's not simply an inside parlor game. There's a November 17th deadline to fund the government. Uh, there are supplemental requests by the White House uh, to, for aid to Israel in the midst of this escalating war in the Middle East for Ukraine as it continues to fend off uh, Russian aggression. They have to pass a farm bill. They have to reauthorize the FAA. They have to uh, reauthorize the Pentagon by the end of this year. There's not a lot of time. And uh, Mount uh, deadlines and tasks to do, Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, boy, a lot going on there tonight, Sahil. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Tonight, we are tracking a powerful hurricane heading toward Mexico as we speak, as we've learned in just the last hour or so that Hurricane Otis is forecast to reach Cat 4 intensity by the time it hits Acapulco. Let's get right to meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, what do we know? This is a dire situation. Residents are gathering food, water, trying to find safe shelters to go to. I'm trying to rack my brain to think when we've had a situation like this, and this is pretty unprecedented. They were not expecting a Category 4 hurricane 24 hours ago. The forecast was for it to be a tropical storm. So tropical storms in tropical areas, they, people don't really do a lot to prepare for them. Maybe some events get canceled. But when you get up to a Category 4, expecting to move into Acapulco, that population is 1 million people. So we're talking a densely populated area. It's too late to get everyone out of the way to evacuate or anything like that. It is hunker down and pray that this goes a little bit to the west of you far enough that you avoid the worst of the winds. So here's the latest from the Hurricane Center. 125 mile per hour winds. About five hours ago, it was only a tropical storm. This has undergone rapid intensification, like super rapid intensification, over extremely warm water. Yeah, thanks climate change once again. And now we're sending this and we're about to do one of those experiments that we never wanted to do. Every 
three emergency managers, every four casters. Like, my biggest fear, even for our country or Mexico or wherever else, is a storm that rapidly intensifies unexpectedly and heads into a major metropolitan area. And that's what's pretty much forecast. This center red line, we're going to stare at this over the next 12 hours until landfall. If it's far enough to the west, Allie, we can avoid the worst in Acapulco. But it's close. I mean, the tight winds are only right around the eye. We need that eye to avoid it. Some of our computer models go just far enough west that we could avoid devastation. Yeah. If it's this orange or red line here, then we're talking they're going to need a lot of help nice. from international sources over the next week or two. Very scary, Bill. We're glad you're keeping an eye on it. Thank you so much. We will also keep it here for any updates on that. Also keep it here for the new CDC alert that a medicine used to keep babies safe from a contagious virus is in short supply. The options parents have. Plus, what happened when women across Iceland, even the prime minister, headed out on strike today? We'll be back. Former President Trump's former fixer and current nemesis, if you will, in court today, pointing the finger at Mr. Trump, accusing him of being personally responsible for lying about how much he's worth. We're talking about Michael Cohen. You see him here in a New York courtroom as part of a $250 million civil trial. He and Mr. Trump hadn't been in the same room together in five years. They've had this very public falling out. Listen to what Cohen said when he was asked outside. Michael, how do you feel to see Donald Trump again? Heck of a reunion, he says, that reunion happening against the backdrop of this split screen. Yet another one of Mr. Trump's former attorneys pleading guilty in a case he's a defendant in, in Georgia. And what amounts to kind of whiplash from Jenna Ellis, who went from leading the charge on Mr. Trump's false election claims, his lies about election fraud, smiling in her mugshot, remember that? Now, tears in court, entering her guilty plea. I believe in and I value election integrity. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. She's getting five years of probation, a fine, and maybe most importantly, a requirement now that she has to testify at future hearings or trials in the case, meaning she could end up testifying against Donald Trump. NBC's Dasha Burns is outside court in New York. We've got two buckets here, right? Let's start with the Michael Cohen bucket, yep. Dasha, because this is in many ways a showdown that has been years in the making. Talk us through it and the significance of what Michael Cohen had to say, pointing the finger at Donald Trump. Yeah, Holly, five years of bad blood spilling out into this courtroom here today. And in this testimony on the stand, Michael Cohen hitting really the heart of this case. Let me read to you some of what he said. He said, I was asked to increase the total assets upon a number that he, Donald Trump, arbitrarily elected. Whenever, whatever number Trump told us, saying later he would look at the total assets and say, I'm actually not worth $4.5 billion. I'm really worth more like six billion. He would ask Alan Weisselberg and I to go back to the office and return with the desired goal. Essentially, they're saying uh, what, what his argument is, what uh, the attorney general's argument is, is that Trump inflated his wealth, that he essentially gave Cohen a net worth goal to achieve, to reverse engineer the documents, to get to that number that he believed he was worth. That wasn't necessarily the true net worth worth. Now, upon cross-examination, Alita Haba, Trump's attorney, began that cross-examination this afternoon. She'll uh, continue tomorrow. Uh, she was quite hard on Cohen, and she did get him to admit that he lied in his 2018 guilty plea hearing, essentially undermining his, uh, his, his truth-telling, Hallie, and undermining him in front of the judge there. So, Dasha, that's the Michael Cohen of it all. Can you pivot a little bit and talk right. about what's happening further down south, right, in this Georgia election interference case with Jenna Ellis? Yeah. Because she's pleading guilty. She now becomes the third former Donald Trump attorney to plead guilty in this case. These are all people, remember, who were very much front and center mm -hmm. in those election fraud lies. I mean, Jenna Ellis was there during that now infamous you know, Rudy Giuliani hair dye press conference that I think people probably remember. It could be potentially very significant now for the former president to have at least three people who were working with him on an attorney-client basis, right, to potentially testify against him here. 
Yeah, no one could forget that hair dye dripping. Look, this is likely going to really strengthen the prosecution's case here. She has pled guilty to aiding and abetting false statements and writings. At the heart of this, Hallie, uh, she was claiming that hundreds of thousands of votes were uh, made illegally, uh, thousands of illegal votes, really as part of a, a campaign to get lawmakers in Georgia to appoint false elector. She has pled guilty to this. Instead of getting jail time here, she got probation, which is certainly going to look appealing to some others who have been charged in this case, which could mean that that number of people you mentioned, the four, could turn into five, could turn into six, so okay. could be a concern uh, for Trump and his legal team. Uh, of course, for in the New York case, in the Georgia case, in all of these cases, he has uh, claimed he is innocent and that this is a witch hunt. We continue to hear uh, that messaging from Trump and his team, Hallie. That's right. Three of his former attorneys pleading guilty, four people overall, and as you point out, who knows how many more. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the eight Ohio police officers involved in the death of Jalen Walker last year are now back on active duty, according to officials. You'll remember they shot and killed Walker, a 25-year-old black man, after a chase via car and on foot. An attorney for Walker's family is telling one of our affiliates tonight the family is, in their words, saddened by the way in which they continue to be ignored by the city of Akron. A grand jury had decided against indicting any of the officers involved. Number two, the Writers Guild of America getting slammed now by some of its members for not coming out with a statement condemning Hamas's terror attack on Israel this month. The WGA East says it has a lot of journalists and didn't want to hurt their work with a statement. The Writers Guild of America West is apologizing today to its members, saying commenting on the Israel-Hamas war felt outside of its scope as a labor union in this country. Number three, dozens of states, like more than 40 of them, so almost all the states in this country are suing Meta, claiming the company is hurting the mental health of kids. Remember, Meta, of course, is the parent company of Facebook, Instagram. The states say that these apps, these platforms, have addictive features specifically aimed at kids and at teenagers. Meta says it is committed to safety and that it's added tools to support kids. Number four, today, tens of thousands of women in Iceland, including the prime minister, look at this, going on a 24-hour strike. You can see a lot of them here in the Capitol. They want an end to pay disparities and to gender-based violence. You saw schools, shops, banks, all shutting down today as the strike went down. Number five, how old do you think the moon is? Well, scientists behind a new study say it's 40 million years older than we thought meaning it formed maybe four and a half billion years ago. This is based on the analysis of samples taken from the moon back during the Apollo 17 mission. So a little trivia factoid for you there. Here's another one. The CDC tonight is warning they're starting to run out of an important medicine given to babies to prevent RSV right at a moment when cases are starting to go up. So now you have pediatricians being advised to prioritize doses of this drug. It's called Bayfortis to babies with the highest risk of getting very, very sick from RSV. The drug company says they had more demand than they thought they were going to see and that they're working with their manufacturer to, I'm quoting them here, to accelerate additional supply. In other words, to try to get more of this stuff out to the people who need it. Remember, RSV is a really contagious respiratory virus. It mostly affects little kids, older people, people with weaker immune systems. Every year it puts 80,000 people in the hospital and kills 300 children under the age of five. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now. So, Dr. Patel, RSV is very serious. Yeah. I think any parent knows mm -hmm. that that's like a thing you, you really want to try to make sure your baby doesn't get. Now we're hearing this warning from the CDC. Talk to us about right. what parents should know, what pediatricians are doing. Yeah, so unfortunately, this is one of the first times we've ever had access to an immunization for RSV. So we should celebrate and applaud that. However, this shortage has created such a demand and there's such limited supply that essentially pediatricians are rationing this. And what they're doing is trying to ration this for babies under the age of six months especially that could be at higher risk born prematurely chronic conditions other things like that any parent kind of listening and watching though should talk to their pediatrician and try to understand because they are making a commitment to expanded supply why was it such a surprise that the demand would be so high and right. that the supply wasn't able to match it here I, I wish I could tell you we've learned from past lessons COVID, all sorts of things but I think people just kind of don't know well look there's gonna be all these educated families that have now been told by the American Academy of Pediatrics right. by people like us talking about it. Go get this. Go get this immunization. This is really going to help save lives. So, what did any? 
parent do that's concerned? They did that. And I think that the company and pediatricians offices were caught off guard and pediatricians have to pay for this to hold it in inventory. And it can be about $300. So it can be expensive. I noticed that you stopped yourself from saying vaccine. Yes, you said not. immunization instead. Right. There's a distinction here. There's a distinction. So technically this is an immunization because it provides man-made antibodies in the form of monoclonal antibodies to fight RSV. It's different than a mechanism of a vaccine like the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine. The outcome is the same. It okay. prevents the illness. Well, a little technical, but we like yes, to hear it. That's right. Looking back sort of big picture, here we are. We're in the fall season. Right. Any, any parent with a kid in school knows yes. this is when the kids are getting sick, right? That's they're, right. They're all getting different. How does the whether you want to call it vaccination or immunization picture low right now for right. everything. Right now, low uptake on flu and COVID vaccines, to be honest. So we'd like to see more parents out there getting their kids vaccinated for the things we do have plenty supply of, and that's COVID and flu shots. But we are seeing an uptick in these illnesses and hospitalizations, just like we did last year, including Dr. RSV. Dr. Kavita Patel, it is a good information to have. Yep. Thank you Thank for you. being here with us. Coming up on the show, a whole lot more, including what else we're learning about that off-duty pilot accused of trying to bring down an airplane. The psychedelic he allegedly may have taken just days before that flight. Plus, the manhunt in Massachusetts for a military vet accused of killing his wife. Stay with us. Right now, the search is on for an Air Force veteran thought to be armed and dangerous, suspected of killing his wife in Massachusetts. Right now, state and local police are looking through hundreds of acres of woods in the town of Gardner. This is about 40 miles northwest of Worcester. This is where officials think he is. It's where they found his car. Aaron Pennington is accused of murdering his 30-year-old wife. First responders found her dead in the couple's bedroom, apparently shot in the face. The two have four little kids. I want to bring in Rahima Ellis here, talk through some of the details of what we know about this, what we know about uh, the suspect here. It's pretty horrifying, particularly for this couple's children. What we know about the suspect, let me put up a full screen for you of who police say this man is. 33 years old, 6 feet 2 inches tall, 175 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. What happened that, that day? Sunday morning, they say, according to the police, the four young children, ages 2, 5, 7, and 9, ran to a neighbor's house crying, saying they couldn't find their father, and their mother was in in the bedroom, locked in a bedroom, and crying. They couldn't get to her. What they did, the police also said, was that a neighbor notified authorities that the suspect's BMW, white BMW, was seen leaving the family home's driveway around 8.50 in the morning. When police reached the home, as you point out, they found the mother in an upstairs bedroom. She had been shot in the face. They found shell casings, but they found no weapon. At this point, they believe that the suspect is armed and dangerous. And what they're saying is the fact that he also has a military background. In a Q&A this afternoon with authorities at a press conference, that question was brought up in terms of what impact it could have in this investigation. Take a listen. Mr. Pennington has a military background. Do you think he has the skill set to survive in the woods? Well, you, you know, that's part of the training. The, those are the questions that the state police have been asking, and they're finding out exactly what training he would have had, wouldn't have had. Yes, that is part of the equation. And authorities say, if you see him, do not engage. Instead, uh, notify authorities, because, again, they believe he's armed and dangerous. Hallie? There was a shelter in place right in town. It has since been lifted. So that was in place over the course of the last day or here. Um, and I have to imagine that this is just so incredibly upsetting, obviously, to people who live in this community. It is uh, disturbing beyond compare. In fact, listen to what some of the residents of the area say about this whole tragedy. I'm horrified. It's never had anything like this. It's such a gentle town, by and large. Kind of petrifying, to be honest with you. Like I said, it's fairly quiet around here. People are friendly. In fact, the friendliness of this community wanted people to come out and have a vigil for the mother, Brianne, who was killed. But the mayor of the town says that he wants them to hold off on that for now because, again, the suspect is still at large. They believe he is armed and dangerous, and they don't want to put anyone else in potentially in harm's way. Kelly. Rahima Ellis, thank you for being on top of this one for us tonight. I appreciate it. Some new and startling details late today about that off-duty pilot being charged with attempted murder after allegedly trying to bring down a plane. He says he took magic mushrooms. He was on shrooms, essentially, 48 hours beforehand for the first time, according to the state criminal complaint. Here he was appearing in court 
just within the last couple of minutes here. This is new video just into us. Something also mentioned in this federal criminal complaint that the pilot, Joseph Emerson, talked with investigators about having taken these psychedelics, these shrooms, before he caught a ride in the cockpit's jump seat during this flight from Washington to California. The complaint says he told police after it happened that he'd been having a nervous breakdown, that he hadn't slept for 48 hours, for, excuse me, for 40 hours, saying he didn't feel okay. It seemed like the pilots weren't paying attention to what was going on. So what did he do? He allegedly says, I'm quoting here from the complaint, I pulled both emergency shutoff handles because I thought I was dreaming and I just want to wake up. He wasn't able to pull the handles down all the way. And after he left the cockpit, he told a flight attendant, you need to cuff me right now or it's going to be bad. I want to bring in justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Just extraordinary details that we're yeah. getting from this, um, this complaint here, Ken. And I'll give you some more. After he left the cockpit, according to the, one of the documents, he tried to open the emergency exit uh, of the plane. Of the plane. Wow. Yep. And was, a flight attendant stopped him. The new information we're getting just moments ago from new court documents is that he's told police that he had been depressed for six years and he had just lost his best friend. Um, and he had acknowledged that he was mentally not in a good place. Uh, nonetheless, these are incredibly serious acts that he allegedly tried to commit and and obviously the criminal justice system taking it very serious i don't know if we have an answer to this Ken. i don't want to put you on the spot here but if he says he took shrooms 48 hours before this flight was he did he show uh, like an appearance of still being intoxicated do we know about that or is that a question mark there is a quote from one of the officers in one of these court documents that said he did not appear to be intoxicated but we're talking about psychedelic drugs here so it's not it's not like alcohol it's not clear that an officer would detect that necessarily we just showed some of that new video of him in court because he now faces more than 80 counts of attempted homicide mm -hmm. essentially among other things here what what's next for this court process for him what does he face so so attempted murder in Oregon carries a mandatory seven attempted and a half murder, yeah. sentence uh, uh, per count. And then he's got this federal charge on top of that. So unless there's some kind of insanity plea here, he looks like he's facing a significant prison sentence in this case. Is there any indication, and the answer may be no, that there is going to be any kind of action taken after this in order to restrict who may be able to kind of catch a ride in those cockpit jump seats? Or is this an instance where if somebody is a pilot, right, who's... Yeah allowed to fly a plane that they kind of get the ability to be able to catch it. This is the thing that we're getting from aviation sources, that pilots are some of the most scrutinized people in the world, yeah. right? They've had background checks. That, so it's it's really hard to go beyond what's already being done. You know, it's really hard to account for people that just have a mental breakdown, I guess, is the bottom line. Candelanian, thank you. Just a, a really a wild story there. I yeah. appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, Louisiana State Police say seven people are dead, more than two dozen hurt after that huge pileup on a highway yesterday. Remember, we told you about it last night. This is when this super fog happened, this really thick fog and smoke mixed together. We now know, according to police, that 158 cars and trucks were involved in this crash. It stretched something like a mile long. Out of our Western Bureau, the mayor of Maui County says all of West Maui is set to reopen to tourists starting next Wednesday. Some of the burned out sections of historic Lahaina will stay shut down. Travelers haven't been able to go there since, of course, that absolutely horrific wildfire incinerated much of that area back in August. It was the deadliest wildfire in this country in more than a century. Also out of our Southern Bureau, former Olympic gymnast Mary Lou Retton is now back at home in Houston, Texas, after she was in the hospital with pneumonia, according to people close to her. Earlier this month, she'd been in intensive care. She apparently couldn't breathe on her own, but her daughter now says that Retton is in recovery mode. Coming up, the new tech, trying to make schools safer. We'll show you how it works. Late today, the New York Police Department is announcing they've seen a 7% increase in hate crimes since the start of the Israel-Hamas war more than two weeks ago. There's also a terror nexus concern, with the NYPD's top expert in that arena saying she's been asked if kids should still be going to school in light of what's happening in the Middle East. She says yes. But it's those concerns that are the backdrop for security ramping up across the country right now. And these may be conversations you're having with the people you love, too. How do you stay safe? What do you do at that crowded concert? How prepared is your kid's school? One app, born out of a nightmare, is now trying to get communities ready in the event of a worst-case scenario. NBC's Tom Winter has more. 
Our country is no stranger to violence in places we once considered safe with shooting. 17 people have lost their lives in this school shooting. After shooting. Yeah, shooting this one taking the lives of 18 children along with three adults. History, after uh, shooting. We have been told that the number of shooting victims is uh, around 20. Kids. America's future killed in their classrooms. Now parents are trying to do something, anything to try and help them. My daughter was Alyssa Alhadev, who was tragically murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14, 2018. Alyssa was only 14 years old. Lori Alhadev says she tried to help Alyssa during the shooting. I texted my daughter, Alyssa. I told her to run and hide that help was on the way. And unfortunately, that help didn't arrive fast enough. Now she's pushing for the passing of Alyssa's law. It mandates that a panic button type device is in every classroom to give teachers and kids a chance. So once that button is pushed, everyone that has the panic button on their phone or in their classroom, on their computer, they will know that there is a medical emergency or an active shooter situation. Technology companies are pushing out different types of app-based buttons. One company says they've developed a tool born out of that very same tragedy. Go back to February 14th, 2018, mm -hmm. Parkland Massacre. Parkland's literally in our backyard, mm -hmm. where I'm from. I actually was right nearby that scene that happened that day. And I'll never forget the sirens, the lights, the police. Rafero says his app, called Safer Watch, can let a school and law enforcement know right away that there's trouble. So let me give you a real life example. It was an armed individual jump over a school fence. Principal took out Safer Watch, pressed the panic button. That instantly notified everyone on campus to go, there's an emergency taking place, actually locked down the school. Simultaneously, that alert from Safer Watch goes to 911. That person was apprehended. Here's how it works. I pop this app open, you say, and I hit this button right here and say it. It's an active shooter. And you say, hold this down for three seconds? Yes. OK. So it's instantly notifying law enforcement. And they're able to instantly see who reported the emergency, exactly where it's happening. You can see it knows exactly where in the building that we are. It knows the incident type. It knows the name of the school. Right, and I have the option here, if I don't want a phone call because something's happening in my classroom, my office, wherever it is, I can say, do not contact, or I can say, hey, I want somebody to call me. I need some help. Exactly. Okay. You can decide your own contact preference depending on the situation that's happening. Everything directly in the app. Click send message and you can upload a media file, record audio, or send a photo. First responders are actually seeing what you're seeing. So when they're arriving on scene, they're more prepared and they're able to take take the appropriate action. Safer Watch isn't law enforcement. They say they act as a conduit between police and people reporting a possible crime. Safer Watch says it's working with all sorts of large public events so people can report something suspicious and be told when an emergency is underway and what to do. Something people are keeping in mind during this heightened threat environment. It's a system Aladev says is in place in the school district where she is the chair of the board. And Alyssa's law is now enacted in five states. It helps to honor my daughter, Alyssa, keep her memory alive. And every time that panic button is pushed, I know that Alyssa is saving lives. I want to bring in Tom Winter now. Tom, what about parents who might be concerned about privacy for their kids on these kinds of apps and this app in particular? Walk that through. Sure, us. Hallie. So Safer Watch says that the data, they don't collect it. So if you're uh, reporting a potential tip or a suspicious photo of an individual, that information goes directly to your local law enforcement agency. They hold on to the data. They have their own policies. It's not something that they keep. If there is, um, and there were to be, God forbid, some kind of an incident, can this app... Um, do something after something happens, right? Or is it more uh, on the front end? Right, Hallie. So one of the things that Safer Watch and some of these other apps tout is the ability to let people know that there is an emergency. So whether it be a, a large concert, public gathering, or a large school campus, the idea behind this, and one of the things that they say is such a compelling case for having these types of applications, is that not only can people report things that are suspicious that are, or that are going on, but in fact can also be told what to do, that there is something going on, and perhaps some additional action to take where to go, what to avoid that type of thing. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Got it. Still to come here on the show, people protesting at the headquarters of Google in L.A. saying self-driving cars threaten their jobs and their safety. Why they're so worried and what Google's saying now. Next. 
We are just learning late tonight that California is suspending GM's self-driving cars there starting ASAP. Why? Why is this happening? Well, because of safety concerns that have come up since the cars got approved back in August to do like robo taxi things around San Francisco. It is safety concerns that are also behind a rally happening today against Google's self-driving cars in Southern California. These are Waymo cars that have been on this tour across L.A. that lets people ride in these, you know, robo cars as the company starts testing the waters for the launch of its own robo taxi service. Think Uber, but the car drive drives itself, basically. Our correspondent from NBC L.A., Michelle Valles, has more. Outside the headquarters of Google here in Venice are Teamsters and local leaders fighting for what they say is a looming threat of jobs and safety. They're against the self-driving cars that have made their way out to the streets here in Los Angeles. Waymo, hell no! Hell no! This issue is an absolute safety issue. I represent the firefighters in San Francisco. Some of the things that they've come across recently is a driverless car dragging a woman for several blocks wow. parked in front of a fire station so we cannot get out. Soon, Angelinos will be experiencing what the drivers of San Francisco and Phoenix already have, and that is self-driving cars. Plenty of mixed reviews, but there is a wait list out there for Angelinos to try out these cars. Waymo is an Alphabet-owned autonomous driving technology company with a mission, they say, to make it safe and easy for people to get to and from. Their research claims there are 50 million injuries and over 1 million deaths worldwide due to human errors like speeding, phone distractions, fatigue, and drunk driving. Adding, we appreciate that people have different viewpoints and encourage them to learn more about the positive impacts that Waymo's autonomous ride hailing is having on safety, accessibility, and sustainability. It is an uphill battle, but we're going to continue to fight this fight because th what's right is right, and that's the safety of our communities. And it's a no-brainer for these politicians. If they, want to if they want to continue to support big tech and not the people, we're going to vote them out. Teamsters basically calling the rollout of self-driving cars reckless. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported that in 2021, Waymo had the most automated driving system crashes of any self-driving company. They say they will continue to fight for their jobs and for the safety of drivers out on the road. In Venice, Michelle Bias, NBC4 News. Our thanks to Michelle for that reporting. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.